Um, I heard what uh, I was listening to what you're talking about. You mentioned yeah. you're going to trigger some stuff. I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know that I'm going to trigger some stuff, but I, I well, just that, meant... that we'll pay attention to yeah. when uh, when the ego is triggered. Yeah. Uh, yeah, ups and downs. But I think yesterday I had a I I entered a place where I felt like I was. Um, like I can tell that there's two modes that I'm in. One is very small and activated and I'm kind of stuck in a in like this hurt, anger, shame thing. And then another which kind of doesn't even understand that. You know, it's like a much more confident place that so I kind of have noticed that when I'm noticing trying. Okay. Trying what? Well, one of the, the practice that you basically gave me was to notice trying. Yep. Um, because I was trying all the time. Yep. And I noticed, I mean, I would love to share the conclusion, you know, kind of the, yeah, bi the bigger please. insight that I felt I got. Can I do that? Yeah, please. So I feel that what I uncovered is this sense. So I, I wrote it down uh, on this little whiteboard. But so like I decided long ago that kind of the world and other people are acceptable as they are. Like I don't really resist what, what is the external world's telling me and then like but because people react negatively to me all the time or i felt that they did as a kid that i'm unacceptable okay so i feel like but i know that deep down i only kind of care about the other people around me or whatever and i'm not going to hurt them you know and i want to be nice and i want to be friends and so oh. i feel like what i noticed is okay i have this inner sense of I just want to be nice. But then the outer response is never that we just be friends and things are simple. It's always it, in my young part or whatever, my young mind, it's like, it always goes wrong. So I decided that basically the problem is somewhere in the middle. Like there's something going on that's about me where I can't get out that I want to be friends and want to be nice and stuff. So what I'm trying to do is I'm kind of trying to control how the stuff that's in gets out into like your brain. <clears throat> yeah, you are trying. You're trying to control that. You're trying to control other people's perceptions of you. That's a hundred. That's what I noticed that I'm trying. And I also noticed that the trying comes with a sense of panic. Yes, absolutely. I'm panicking at a very low level pretty constantly. Okay. And panic to me, it's kind of like, <clears throat> even if I write something on my hand in big letters, I can't see it because I'm like ruffling through the papers of how to fix the thing. Like the in panic, there's like such little awareness. It's just on one thing. Okay. So <clears throat> let me just pause. Okay. We're good. Are we good on volume? Perfect. Okay. Sorry. So the, I was adjusting volume. So I, 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 I couldn't give you a hundred percent attention, but can you tell me that part again about, so you accept other people for who they are, but somewhere along the way you decided that you yourself were unacceptable. That's right. And that <clears throat> when you interact with people, you feel some degree of panic because so panic is a manifestation of fear and mm -hmm. fear is related to a particular outcome. Yeah. What is the outcome that you're afraid of? Um, well, that, OK, that's interesting. So I guess the outcome that I'm afraid of simply is that people are not going to see the real me. Okay. Like that, but it's really, it's kind of a, a bigger story where it's my fault. You know, I'm going to mess this up again. Okay. So tell me about when you started messing things up. So as I thought about it, um, I kind of realized that my thinking that I messed things up started from a very young age. Like I have yeah, little flashes that. of, um, you know, I remember my uncle John was hella cool with me. I remember the people who felt safe. And I remember it was a small list of people. And I also remember that circumstances changed and that the safe people would sometimes become unsafe. And I didn't know why. So I want you to just understand for a minute. Uh -huh. So let's, we're going to dig into that for a second, okay? But the first thing that I want you to understand is that your mind operates in different modes. Yes. Right? So when you're with safe people... The sum scar is dormant. Okay. And and so then that complex yes. of like, I need to make sure that this person likes me. I need to be careful with what I say. 
this like all that complex like that's why you think about your uncle because your your samskar was dormant and then what happens is the samskar activates around other people or some people who you thought were safe do something that activates the where your buddhi your intellect says oh this actually matches the samskar we're actually not safe right now this is that situation yes it it looks like a horse but it's actually a wolf and oh my god we have to be careful it's like a wolf in in horse's clothing right so you, it and, and so let's I talk i didn't get the i didn't yeah, get the it's wolf a bad in horse's clothing. it's okay, a bad cool. analogy to, i was just kind of saying that like it looks but like I think one I thing i understand what you're saying yeah it looks like one thing but then your mind says actually it's not what you think it is that person is not safe that person is dangerous and we have to be back on we have to go back to controlling the way that they think about us yeah so tell me about <clears throat> tell me about like who like what do you remember about like when you started to feel like you had to control other people's perceptions? That's a really good question. Give me give me a second. I can remember <clears throat> excuse me. I can remember being like 4 or 5 or whatever and being around aunts and uncles and having the sense that I'm supposed to say something mm -hmm. and not knowing what that thing is. I also remember pretty clearly the feeling of when I did talk about what was interesting to me, which is nerdy shit. No one understood what I was talking about. And people would kind of look at each other and everybody would be like, oh, this is weird. <laughs> and so, uh, I guess I didn't draw the conclusion yet that the the answer or the solution was to control, but I do remember feeling that feeling that I respond to with the trying at a very young age. Yeah. Your so your question so, was when did I know when do I remember actually trying though, right? Sure. We can we can start, stay where, yeah, with we can where start you are. There. So I, I want you to just put yourself in the mind of a four or five year old who tries to mm -hmm. talk to an adult. And the adults kind of like, it's clear that they sort of care about you, but then they kind of, oh. Yes. How does that make the four-year-old feel? What happens in the four-year-old's mind? You're asking about what I think a different four-year-old. I identify so strongly with the four-year-old that I'm, I find that when you ask me that question, I feel you're just asking me. Yep. Okay. What happens in your mind? What happened in your mind? It's almost worse right that this person like has to love me and care about me and they can't find what i'm talking about interesting it's like holy shit i must be so weird and boring or whatever that like the deck stacked in my favor absolutely it's still screwing it up so 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 now we see actually that the sum scar is enhanced because of their caring of you yeah right the the 100 the hurt that you feel you're like these people they have to accept me yeah. But it's clear to me that they shouldn't want to. Yes. Yeah. Actually, as you bring that up, I noticed like. <laughs> an inherent discomfort with the feeling that someone might accept me or want to be around me because they're compelled to not that they are voluntarily choosing choosing. Like I have a hair, like a hypersensitivity to. Yep. So that. now we get to also something. So I think when you try to control other people's reactions towards you, I imagine that that's quite painful for you. Yeah. And you can't help yourself. Okay, could I refine? I mean, this sure. could be just, you know, this could be, um, you know, ego and stuff. I mean, I would love help with understanding what's going on in my mind, actually. My sense is that I carry the sense that I'm unacceptable with me all the time. Mm -hmm. And that I actually am not necessarily trying to control the other person's reaction so much as perfectly filter out what I am putting out there to avoid the part that's like the unacceptable me. So I am in a sense trying to control their reaction, but from my own locus of control, yeah, right? I'm absolutely. Absolutely. Controlling so, my presentation. So, yeah. So in a Great. So, so I, I think you're spot on. So that's what I mean. So what I'm, what I'm saying is okay. that you're not letting people form a genuine and authentic judgment of you as a person. Absolutely not. I feel I've already made that decision on their behalf. 
actually one of the things I noticed with the trying as I was, you know, in the past week is that, for example, if at work I want to get something, you know, I think that something's really important and it's the right thing to do. I will immediately go to a line of reasoning that's basically like, I know that you shouldn't agree with this idea just because I'm saying it. I'm so untrustworthy. So don't look at me. Look at the the evidence and the document that was produced and like the track record. Like look at the objective stuff because if you look at me, I know that you're going to conclude that I'm bad and wrong. You should do this idea in spite of the fact that I'm attached to it or associated with it. Does that make yeah, sense? Makes a lot of sense, right? Like so predetermine that. Yeah, so your conclusion is that, and that too, so you're trying to filter the part of yourself which is unacceptable, and, and you're relying on documentation and logic for people to, because if they actually saw you, yes. if they're, the more they're able to uncouple you from your work product, yeah. the more, the better the work will be. And if they see who you are, then they're not going to have faith in you. The you know the work should stand on its own two feet, and it shouldn't be like tainted by association with you. Right. So and, and Which, so I, it, unfortunately, also I think happens to be true in terms of like when I think about ideas for myself, I shouldn't just believe what I think because I think it because that's like you know what I mean. Sure. I should be yeah. super objective. So it's unfortunate that I've kind of that that that's true because I. But anyway, that was a that was a tangent. So so let's go to why do you so when you filter what mm -hmm. does that feel like for you when you filter who you are and present it to the rest of the world what does that feel like for you uh, yeah it feels terrible what feels terrible it feels about terrible it? The, mostly um well, what feels terrible about it honestly when it feels really bad is the the bigger picture feeling that I have is that I'm here and I just want to be helpful and I don't want to hurt anybody and I don't need anything in return. And uh, no matter what I do, that will never come across. That's what it feels like in my mind. Like, I, I don't know. I feel like I want it. Did someone, my intent is to, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. It's like, it's like, the ideas that I like are ones that everybody likes. And so like I'm coming and I'm trying to say like, Hey, I think I know how to help. Like we could do this thing and then it's going to be good for you and you and you and you and you. And actually everyone wins and it's better because these people are hurting and they'll hurt less. And like y'all are stressed out. You'll be less stressed out. Like, let's just do this. And it's like, it, there's this idea that feels super pure. That's just going to get, it's almost like a dog. that's going to get kicked. It's like this innocent kind of thing that for whatever reason I can't, uh, so, so the I, when the idea gets kicked, you mean that <clears throat> something pure is going to get rejected? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Why do you think and that it's happens? Be my fault. Because the reason it gets rejected is because it gets ended and it ends up getting associated with you. <sighs> um. Well, to be honest, so it, it's like I already know the end of the movie. You brought that up with somebody else before, where. I'm not, this is not, now that we're talking about it, it's very clear to me that this is not logical, but I've predetermined that that's how it's going to end. Okay. Like there's a, there's something that I have that I want to share with the world and it's a good, pure thing. And at the end of the day, it's going to get rejected and it's going to be my fault. Who did that to you when you were young? What did you share with people that was rejected? Damn, dude, isn't it like everything? My thoughts, my attention. Is it everything? My offers to help. Okay. Um, like my I mean, presence? Yeah, is that how you felt? Did you feel like your, your presence was offensive? Like, it, does something come yeah. to mind? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, Can you well, share that with us? Well, presence being off offensive, I think like grade school, uh, I felt Tell that Tell me about way. that. Um, yeah, I have a couple, I have a, a number of memories that are, that are around friends that I had when I was young that mm -hmm. 
I had falling outs with for various reasons and, and kind of uh, sensed that it was my fault or something. I don't know where to start because I think it's kind of tangled in some sure. ways. So why don't you just start with, uh, just start anywhere. All right. Uh, so that can, just give me a memory. So I remember being really good friends with this kid who lived across the street. Uh, Beautiful. It was a summer home. He was older than me. So maybe I was five or six, maybe he was eight or nine. And I thought that he was the coolest person in the history of the world. Uh, and, you know, we hung out, like we did stuff, so on and so forth. He would come to my house. I would go to his house. Uh, and then one day he asked me, he was like, hey, let me see your laser pen. My mom had just bought me a laser pen. It was like 90 bucks or something like that, which is a lot of money when you're that young. I don't know why my parents would buy a night. Anyway. And so I went to grab it and I like opened the drawer where it was and it wasn't there. So long story short, you know, it was like pretty clear that he stole it. And like, he was just doing that as he's a stupid kid, like stupid kids draw attention to things that, that they did. Um, and I definitely remember. Ooh. So I remember that my parents kind of got involved and they talked to his parents and it was kind of like, he wouldn't admit it and like, was not upset about it. And, you know, they, they were like, okay, this is, you know, you can't be friends with him. And I distinctly remember, uh, feeling like, I didn't really care that he stole the laser pen. I'd rather be, I'd rather have a friend. Mm -hmm. And so I almost felt like it was my fault that they found out that they stole it, that he stole the thing. Cause if they didn't find that out, then I still would have my friend. So you felt responsible for y'all's friendship ending. Yeah. I remember feeling responsible. Yeah. I, I remember just feeling like I had this thing that was, you know, kind of beautiful to me or precious to me, like a real, like a, like a really cool friend and it was gone. And I didn't do everything that I could have to stop that from happening. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost as if you had filtered yourself and not shared that with your parents. Yeah. And y'all would still be friends. Yeah. Maybe we would. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I also I'm, remember later, which I think is like built on top of this one wound or whatever sure. that, you know, he told me these stories about this game clock tower where he was like, Oh yeah, you could do anything. And like, I found this woman and like killed her and stuffed her in a basement or some shit. And I remember tell, I know it's a, kind of messed up and I didn't understand how messed up it was at the time. And I remember that I shared that in second grade when a teacher said some shit about like, uh, are video games violent or good or whatever? I love video games, but for whatever reason, I volunteered this information. But then I found out that was a lie. So it kind of recontextualized the relationship I had with him in the first place, where like not only did he steal this thing and not care, but also lied to me about some things that I thought were super cool. So now I've got this judgment from my younger self for even thinking that he was so cool. So you blame so yourself like for thinking he's... That you blame yourself for him thinking that he was nice to you when he was mean to you yes so that i think is I have separate. a lot of that yeah okay it's probably separate but i have a lot of that like i notice that when i look back at myself i really feel not good about who that person was in what way what do you not feel good about i just feel like what do i feel not good about i feel like such an idiot when i think that i'm okay and something gets recontextualized as I'm not okay. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense. So let me put it's it like to you. It's like when I have the slight hope that I am acceptable, because like this whole sub scar is about unacceptable, when I have the slight hope that I am, and then I learn something later that's like, oh, you were actually wrong there too. It's like, wow, I was such an idiot for even like hoping. Yeah, so that, that actually does sound very related. It just is, is you tie those two things together, right? Because what I'm hearing from you is that you have learned that your confidence and your perception of acceptability turns out to be false. Yeah. But that too, so I want you to notice this, that is very selective buddhi. That's selective reasoning. Say more. Right? So, in the place where I'm at, I don't even see it, which so, is so, proof of the phenomenon. Exactly, right? So, so, like that's, so, so if we just think about, you know, a, can a five-year-old appropriately judge the intentions and quality of friendship that an eight-year-old offers mm. no. absolutely not it's fucking absurd 
Five-year-olds will get owned day after day after day by eight-year-olds. You, like, literally don't know what's going on. Yeah, literally. Like, you just, you do not even have, yeah. you're, you're playing, it's like you're playing a game without a controller. It's, it's like, like Shrek. It's like Shrek, how little kids can watch Shrek, and all these jokes just go way over, like, they Absolutely. have no awareness that, the, they, and so Shrek is running circles around little kids. Yeah, and, and yet... So even when we stop and think about that, but like, that's not how you see yourself, right? You, you have a standard that you should have known better. You shouldn't have let him take advantage of you. Yeah. In a sense, what you're doing is not, you're being unacceptable towards yourself. Like you are not accepting who you are. Yeah. Right. And, and, and I, th I think that that's the crux. So, I mean, we're talking about other people not accepting you and, and where the feeling of unacceptance comes from. I, I think wherever it comes from, <clears throat> it's certainly reinforced by yourself or propagated mm. actually by yourself. I think the linchpin here is that you don't accept who you are. It's not about actually showing people. So it's, it's actually funny because you kind of think other people can't see the real me. But what it really is that is that you don't think that the real you is worth showing. Because you are you aren't OK. That's why you have to filter. Because you're tainted. I agree. I agree with everything on a visceral level, except the phrase that I don't think the real me is worth showing. It's like I, <clears throat> I think maybe what feels more correct is that I've already looked and I know it's not good enough, kind of thing. So it's not that it's worth sure. showing. It's just that I know what I'm going to show, and it's not what it needs to be. Actually, the the thing that clicked for me yesterday, I was talking to a good friend and a, and a guru, um, <clears throat> and he was kind of asking about when I chose to look at myself that way, when I chose to not be acceptable mm -hmm. to myself. Mm -hmm. And that does seem like the original, that seems like the thing that persists, like, yeah, my own. Yeah, go ahead. I, I completely agree. I mean, I, I think this is propagated by you, right? So now we have to understand. So even though, Bobby, this is yeah. this causes you suffering. This is how this whole complex is based to protect you. Yeah, because if you believe that you are unacceptable, then you can't then other if other people then you have to filter because if they see what's unacceptable, it's going to be a no brainer. They're going to reject you. <clears throat> but this really comes down to where so two things right so one is where that belief comes from and when you started to build your life around that belief early so now i'm going to ask you when you feel this way at work like when you feel like the rejection is inevitable it's going to be kind of a weird abstract question that may not make sense how old are you Actually, my sense of internal structure collapses. So Absolutely. I think I'm, I must be so young because I don't even have a sense of like my physical body. Absolutely. Makes sense. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. <clears throat> so I think what you are. I think that's a good practice. I mean, I just want to share that because I think it would be helpful for others. Like if you notice that sometimes you feel like you have structure. And sometimes if you track that, sometimes you feel like you have literally no structure. Like that's, I think, really meaningful because that's the thing that really clicked for me is that. I have a sense of my structure right now talking to you. Yep. But when I think about being at work, I actually don't even. Yeah. I feel so, like I don't have a body. So when a samskar activates, it returns your mind to the age at which it was formed. Mm -hmm. So. <clears throat> uh, and so I think what's happening is like a four or five year old doesn't really have a sense of internal structure. Right. They don't. So I, I think what's happening is like you're evoking these thoughts or feelings that come from there. They don't yeah. actually come from the here and now. They come from the past. Yeah. And so <clears throat> I'll just give you another example. So I was I was working with someone and um, they had a lot of social anxiety. And um, we were talking through like what that meant for that, like what that felt like for them. And and then, you know, like I, I kept on asking questions and like he was just unable to give me any kind of sophisticated answers. Like, I was asking, like, what's the feeling? And he's like, I don't really know. Like, what's the, mm -mm. you know, so, so then we were talking about, so he wanted to get a, he wanted to get a job, but he felt embarrassed to go into, like, a place and ask for an application for a job. And as we talked to, like, how irrational that is, like, it didn't really make a dent. 
And so then, like, eventually, like, we got to, like, I pushed him and I pushed him and I pushed him. And his response was, I just don't want to. Yeah. And that's it. Right? It's not complicated. It's not, like, Freudian. There isn't yeah. this deep subconscious conflict. It's just somewhere along the way, when he interacts with people, when his mind formed this idea, I just don't want to. It's, like, not even a fully formed, like, grammatically correct sentence. Yeah. The core of it is I just don't want to. And that's yeah. actually enough. That can be the end of the road. Yeah. And the interesting yeah. thing is he's doing way better now because like now he realizes that like in him, there's a part of his mind that is just not going to want to do something. And you can't make sense of it. It's not some deep subconscious conflict. There's no Oedipal want to sleep with your mom and knock out your dad or like any of these deep complicated stories. It's just within him, there's a seven year old who just didn't yeah. want to go to school because he was bullied. And mm -hmm. he didn't want to put himself in front of people. And he just doesn't want to. That's it. It's the end of it. Yeah. There's nothing to unpack. There's nothing to explore. That's it. And he carries that seed of I just don't want to with him all the time. And there are times where that seed emerges, like most of the time, like he's able to do things with his friends and stuff like that. And he actually does want to do things. He does want to get a job. He wants to get a job at particular places. He thinks the people who work there are cool. He'd like to work there. He thinks it would be fun to work there. And when he thinks about walking up to them and asking them for a job application, the I just don't, he gets a case of the I just don't want us. And that's the sum scar that activates. And the real challenge here is that people think, so like, Bobby, you think this is you, right? You operate under the assumption that this is who you are. Mm -hmm. Like your conclusions, you don't treat this as like an external thing. You treat this as you. Yeah. So, so he just feels like he's a lazy fucker because he's got a part of him that just doesn't want to. And he identifies with that. He doesn't understand that that is just a sum scar that activates from time to time. And if you actually look at your life, that you are valued by many people, that he's appreciated and loved and people think he's cool and funny and also physically and sexually attractive. And, and like all kinds of stuff that he just like, the, I just don't want is, is not able to hold that. And so in your case, I mean, you say that you have all this kind of conflict and that you're unacceptable and that you've gotten really, really good at filtering yourself, which is probably how you rationalize your success. But it sounds like you have a kid and you're married and you have friends and you have meaningful relationships. And also you've, you've, you've held a job for years. And so you're not so abrasive or toxic that they fired you, which they do. And so like, let's just think about that for a second. Are you so good? at filtering that you have fooled all of these people um <clears throat> so the way that i rationalize it is actually with a sense of duty and responsibility to the other people who feel the way that i feel i think somewhere along the line i got the sense that i wasn't alone in feeling i was unacceptable i, I think that this is important because i think that i actually grew like this separate part with that belief in other words i don't necessarily rationalize in other words if you ask me why i think i'm successful i would say that like i get it i get the struggle i build products for the people who have the struggle that i have hmm. not everybody has the struggle that i have and i i don't think that i'm better than them at all i just think that if you haven't gone to this deep dark place of all that stuff and you haven't really looked around you don't get how sensitive it is as a four-year-old as a five-year-old as a seven-year-old and so when I'm building products, I'm holding the four, five, six, seven year olds and all of us like in that design. I'm and beautiful. I feel that like, do you know what so I mean? That's, so that's, that's, I'm with you. So that's your dharma and that's your karma. So this yeah. is how karma and dharma relate. They're right? so, so related. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. So explain that to us. So I've had experiences in my life that have been painful. They haven't killed me. <laughs> um, and for a long time, I thought I was alone in that. And that really hurt. And so I know how much hurt there is in that feeling. And because I know how much hurt there is, I know how important it is to tend to that and how 
hungry people are for <coughs> that kind of tending and that kind mm -hmm. of attention. So I know that, you know, through that negative experience, I have something that, you know, later on, I don't know how it happened inside me, but I decided that we're not alone and I can do something about it. And, and if I never had the experiences, if I never had, if I didn't have the karma, if I wasn't led to the place where I, where I was, where I made that decision, that that's the thing that I'm going to fix, then, you know, I could never have the, the duty and responsibility to do it. So perfect. First. Right. So, so your karma, even your hurt and your suffering yeah set you up to do your duty or responsibility yeah. they made you the person that you are and without those experiences you would not be able to have hurt and suffering at the forefront of creating products for like creating stuff at twitch yeah exactly right, right. which is kind of bizarre because when you think about product developers at twitch i don't think that that's the kind of thing that they would be thinking about but i think if you know you've been at twitch for six years and twitch has done very well over the last six years I think part of the reason is because you're keeping something really like like deeply spiritual for lack of a better term. I mean, I just call it spiritual, but maybe psychological, whatever. At the forefront of the work that you do. And it doesn't yeah. surprise me that you're successful there. So but at I, the same time, I feel right. It's a part of the exact same narrative where it's like, hey, this is the thing that I'm doing and it works. And you will never, you, right? The others, the people who find me unacceptable, you'll never believe me and never let me do the work that I feel I have to do. That's where the conflict comes in and where I yeah, really so, start to, to control and have that so, anger so, hurt swirl. Good. So let's talk about that. So the first thing is that I think that these things are not actually like related I think mm -hmm. the dharma and karma is sort of a genuine sense of who you are. And I think yeah. the unacceptability, like the dharma is what lets you tolerate and get away with your feelings of unacceptability. But I don't believe for a second that having the dharma that you have makes people like you. And that if you've been successful at Twitch for six years and you've managed to get married and you have friends and stuff like that, that human beings are pretty good at like judging other human beings. And that there's something that they see in you that they actually do wholeheartedly accept. Otherwise, yeah. they because here's the thing, you're abrasive, right? Yeah. It depends. It depends on no. if I feel so, that I... But so yes. let's, let's yeah, just, say just say yes. Say, let's just say yes. Let's and just so just yes. think about this for a second. For someone who's as abrasive as you are, they sure <laughs> as hell have to accept something deep within you to have to like work with you on a day-to-day -day basis yeah right yeah i am very different in yeah. different contexts but uh -huh. but i think ultimately like i have to agree i mean i think you're what what is my sense i have this sense that the you know i'm unacceptable the people who accept me anyway those are the safe people the people who don't those are the unsafe people that's kind of how i've rationalized it that sure. there's a, there's some people who can e who can accept someone even like me. Yeah, so I think that that makes sense. I I don't think that that's really a rationalization. I think that's actually just an accurate observation. That mm -hmm. for with some people they you know you you have the perception that you show them the real Bobby and they accept you and therefore they're safe. And that yeah. there's a larger camp of people who can't you can't let them see the real Bobby because they won't accept you. And and then you're like abrasive and combative and you don't understand why they don't understand what you're trying to tell them and stuff like that. And it sounds like actually in some ways you're hard to work with. Yeah, that's probably true. Yeah. And the bizarre thing is I, that I'm sure that that's true. I'm sure yeah. that that's true. And the bizarre thing is, is that I don't know it, what to do about it. Yeah, Sorry. we'll get to that. Yeah. So but the bizarre thing is that if we really look at your situation, if you have an abrasive person who people continue to work with, rather than them being unacceptable, their acceptability has to be way higher because your abrasiveness is making it like harder to deal with you. Sure. Yeah. So in a really weird way, I think like the safe people are way larger, that that group is way larger than you realize. Yeah. So. I think you're right about that. Yeah. Yeah. So now the question is like, where do we go from here? Okay, so the first is I want you to recognize that, you know, as we start to think those kinds of thoughts, that runs contrary to the perception and construction that you've made, right? Which is that your perception <coughs> is that you're unacceptable on the inside, 
and through a lot of lot of surface level filtering, you can create an appearance of acceptability. But what I'm actually hearing is quite the opposite, is that on the outside, you can sometimes be difficult and abrasive. So you're not creating anything like the filter. You're actually creating like a negative filter, not a positive filter. Yeah, and negative despite, filter. Despite the negative filter that you're putting out in terms of your abrasiveness and your, you know, internal sense of your unacceptability, people are yeah. able to see through that bullshit and still value working with you in some capacity. Yeah, my real sense, actually, so I have the sense that I'm acceptable deep, deep down, but no one will ever, ever know it. Like, whatever, however I talk, however I interface with the rest of the world, I, in other words, like, there's some gold deep down, but there's so much shit between the gold, which is me or whatever, that no one will ever see the good. Right? That's the struggle that I live with every day. Okay. That I know deep down there's value. And that I want to help. And then if I, if only I didn't, if only I wasn't such a problem, that stuff could get out into the world. So give, <coughs> does that help make me sense? Under, makes perfect sense. Okay. So what I'm hearing is, so I'm going to ask you a question. When, so tell me about, <coughs> if you remember anything about when someone didn't dig through the shit and find the gold. When they looked inside you, you opened the doors and they just saw a sea of shit and they like ran away. Um, I remember feeling misunderstood as a kid where, uh, so, okay, I have a really strong memory. I don't know if I brought it up where it was a Sunday and I was playing with my cousins. Did I bring that memory up? Mm -mm. I was having so much fun. It was the kind of childish, joyous fun where, you know, the whole rest of the world's gone and you're just where you are. And then on Monday, it turned out that I had homework that I was supposed to do. And I just, you know, I had, you know, my pants, I was caught with my pants down and, this is maybe the third time that I forgot to do homework or something like that. And I remember really getting uh, the riot act or whatever, you know, I remember that really being like, Hey, you, you've got a problem here and this cannot happen anymore. And so it's kind of recontextualizing that joyous fun with, right. Like who that. gave you the riot? I act? Couldn't, well, my parents. And I think the teacher was like, not, not particularly happy. Okay. I remember one time very clearly I was in fourth grade. I remember it so well that, Something happened, the teacher said something, and like I was actually listening to them, but I think I was doing it in an abrasive way where it was kind of a know-it-all way. And I actually got punished just for clarifying like what the teacher had said because I knew that somebody else didn't understand what they said. And I just felt like, what the F? You know, I'm actually trying to help you do your job and I'm getting punished. Like that makes no sense. Hmm. So I it's like, almost this is what just... I thought I was supposed to do, and I'm getting punished for what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is that you offered your gold and they perceived it as shit. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like when I think back to my childhood, there was a lot of mixed messages. Like there was a lot of times when I would be in trouble for no reason. Like maybe my dad would be having a bad day and he was just stressed and I did I couldn't understand that he was just venting. Can you tell me about um, your dad? Yeah, my dad. I think that if people knew my dad, it would make so much sense uh, out of me. <laughs> Um, he, uh, he's so, okay. He's like basically always the coolest guy in the room. Um, he's a shorter Italian guy. I think he's five, seven or something like that. You know, it's like a, he doesn't look like Joe Pesci at all. You know, he's like skinnier and stuff. Uh, he's more Vata for sure. Uh, but you know, I, I, he tells a story where he went to a party one time and a, a woman said to him like, uh, who are you? Like, I, you, you're somebody, right? And he was like, I could have been somebody kind of thing. Um, and he definitely like, uh, yeah, he, he runs the show. It was very clear for like the whole extended family. He's like the patron, the padron. Uh, and he uh, is very vocally critical about kind of like anybody being lazy or not pulling their weight or whatever. And so he kind of uses humor, but he's using humor to kind of keep everybody in check. If mm. that makes sense. He's like policing. And what do you think that uh, what you said, you said earlier that if people like knew my dad, they'd, they'd understand you better. How does that help yeah. us understand you? I've said it. I said, I've said it for a long time, but I don't necessarily know that I've thought about why I think it. Sure. Why do I think it? Yeah. What does that tell you about? Uh, what does that tell us about you? Well, I've got his blood in me, and also I grew up as, you know, under his kind of power and authority. 
mm-hmm. and if you see the way that he acts you'll you'll sense a tremendous amount of stress and anxiety as well as like a loud kind of personality um, what 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 does in what way does he act that makes you feel stress and anxiety i he feels a lot of stress and anxiety like i think that all of his external stuff is just dealing with his internal state you know the the fact that like his body system is telling him like like flooding him all the time with like threat signals or whatever okay i feel definitely consistently overwhelmed by like my body telling me that like there's something really wrong hmm. i think he does too what is your body telling you is wrong now sure Dude, the world's the world's in a bad spot. We got to do something. <laughs> okay. There's people suffering. I think it's sixty percent of people are lonely in America. So it's like two out of three or something like that. I don't know. Some crazy number. And you feel that in your body? I can, yeah. What does that yeah. feel like? Uh, tightness in my chest. Um, like a kind of burning focus. Um. It's a, a sense of like fire and constr- like a it's like the laser beam, right? It's a strong focused energy in a direction. Uh, and it comes with kind of like an impatience mm-hmm. and a, and a an anger around why isn't anybody looking at this? I kind of feel that a lot. Yeah. My dad told me his dad was actually a union organizer, so not a union <laughs> leader or whatever, but he was the guy who was in the factory saying like, what are we doing? <laughs> Yeah. These guys are making all the money and we're getting screwed. Like, what are we doing? And he was so nuts about it that he actually fucking, right, founded a union. Yeah. So like you that have, kind of feeling. You have, I feel like I've got that in me, you know. Absolutely. You do. That's bit the I learned the that very late in life, by the way. What, what, hmm. what, what is it? That's bit the. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I've got all, I've, I've tried doshik. That's how I feel. But you, well, you're primarily vata and pitta. So I'm sure, I mean, everyone has some degree of doshas, but if, if you have a fair amount of color in your face, for example, and then, you know, we also see that, you know, you're, you're irritable, abrasive, driven, focused, all bit like attributes. Uh-huh. Um, and yeah, so Bobby, I think, um, yeah, you're right. <clears throat> you know, when, when you talk about your dad, I certainly think that that's significant, but I'm still a little bit curious about how he contributed to you becoming the person that you are. He thought I was, he was stressed all the time that I was not going to make it. I remember him walking around just being like, this kid's not going to make. It. He's just not going to make it. I'm not going to, this kid's not going to make it. I remember he would say, it's not a one-time thing. He would say that a lot. Just kind of like throwing his hands up. Like, this kid's not going to make it. I, I can't what, protect him. <laughs> what is, what does that do to you? What does what does that do to a kid? Something. Yeah. Uh, especially when I felt deep, deep, deep down that that was not correct. Right. Mm-hmm. It's this feeling of there's something down here that he can't see, and nothing I fucking do will ever change that. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How could it be that there actually is something good here and he can't see it? Like he's my, you know what I mean? How could it be like there must be something so wrong in the rest of me that that's what it feels like, right? Yeah. So what have we been talking about for the past 30 or 40 minutes? We've been talking about this. Absolutely. Yeah. We've been so talking now- about the sense that like there's something So so a lot of things are clicking. Right. So you said that there are a couple of things. One is that he can't see it. And yeah. all he sees is you fucking up and forgetting your homework. And he right. also lets you know or whatever it is, like random stuff. Yeah. So so it, and that, that's actually a significant detail because it's not. So if it's just one thing, then you end up with a some scar that you're bad at homework. You're like, oh, man, I suck no. at school or I'm not good at studying. No. Head but in if the you're, clouds. Right. That kind of thing. Like an airhead yeah. like doesn't. But, it, but it, if it's. <laughs> So it's 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 multidimensional for him, which also means that you're not unacceptable in one way. You're unacceptable in every way. Yes, yeah, generalized. Yeah, 
Yes. And then there's also something subtle, which you kind of mentioned some time ago, which we haven't really explored, but there's something that bothers you about people who clearly you're not acceptable, but they have to love you anyway. Mm -hmm. And that sounds like, I mean, it sound, if we had to, you know, take that statement out of context from half an hour ago and plug it in here, it fits perfectly because we're talking about, of all people, your dad. Mm hmm. Yeah, and it's kind of like, I guess I had the sense that other people were kind of faking it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. So that, I think, is also completely rational for a young kid. Mm -hmm. Because you trust your yeah. parents, and you, you sort of set your compass, like you set the gold standard based on how your parents treat you. And if the rest of the world is congruent with that, that's fantastic. And if it's not, you don't accept the rest of the world. And I see this a lot, actually, in cases of abuse, where, like, when a child is taught that they're a piece of shit, and then, like, like when they're adults, and, like, people treat them with love and care and respect, how do you think they respond? Not well. Why not? Uh, well, yeah, like, you kind of can't believe it, right? You, you Absolutely. You have to come up with a story that makes it not the simple truth. Like, Absolutely. You can't just be that simple. Perfect. It's fucking confusing and bewildering to them. They do not understand yeah, it confusing. at all. Yeah. It's so confusing. Yeah. And so then what they do is is they, they start doing all kinds of weird acting out behaviors to yeah. align the relationship with what they believe about themselves. Yeah. Right? So they start doing things that drive their partners, like I'm just thinking about romantic situations where like someone is genuinely like loved and cared for by another person, and that's so confusing for them. So then they start doing things that shift the relationship towards something that they like are familiar with, which actually is to try to incite their partner to like get angry with them or or is sometimes even like try to get them to be physically abusive. Um, I I've worked with someone who literally would like just attack their partner because they wanted their partner to like beat the shit out of them. And the partner just wouldn't do it. And it was just really, really confusing. And it took some time to untangle. But it's wild, like what people will do. Like they want to play the game that they know how to play. Yeah. And so the funny thing is that if we want to get really sort of, you know, loose associations, what do you do at work? Yeah. Um, okay, how do I have an original idea about this right now? Because as you asked that question, I know I've said things along these lines about my behavior and reflection in the past. In other words, I'm kind of don't give me to don't give me the answer that I don't give me the answer that I want. Don't give me the right answer. Answer. Give me your answer. The one that pops into my head when I look at my own behavior is like I'm trying so hard to get the gold out and I kind of go up to dad and but I do it in this way that's self-defeating. You know what I Absolutely. mean? Like I, I do it in a way where and I'm not but the, the thing is that I feel very blind to what is happening in the middle. Yep. You know? As do they. But if you're fucking abrasive at work, you're driving them towards unaccepting. Yeah. Yeah. You're trying to make them feel about you the way that you feel about yourself because then the world makes sense. And then on the flip side, you're trying to do the exact opposite because you're paranoid and you're fighting and you're conflicted. And that's why, like, it sounds like you're in a state of semi-constant torture. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sounds awful, man. Yeah. It's not, yeah, it's not fun. It's definitely not fun. <coughs> So, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think personally it's a little bit of a stretch to think that you're really sort of subconsciously kind of driving people towards being unaccepting. That's the kind of, you know, psychoanalysis level bullshit that I normally call bullshit on. Um, so yeah, I think what I do, right, is like I'll go into an interaction. I don't think I start as abrasive necessarily, but maybe I do. Honestly, when I feel more like it's a powerful person or a person with power, I am worse. That's for sure. So let me ask you something. If someone starts to accept your ideas, is generally accepting your ideas, how do you feel? I think a little bit desperate. See? This is weird. 
Desperate. Right. So this makes perfect sense. This is consistent with our hypothesis because what's yeah. actually happening is you are getting accepted. They're actually yeah. accepting your ideas. And then you get confused. And then you get desperate. One yeah, would I think, think I get desperate. It's like it's like it's there's a thing here that I've that I want so badly and like I can't let it get away kind of thing. And so what do you do in your interactions with them? Like dump. Absolutely. Dump. What does that mean? So there's basically it's like a dam there's like a dam of all these things that i've wanted to share with people for years and years and years and so hmm. you know it's like i feel like no one is ever going to listen sort of thing because of because i suck and so if i sense that someone is listening it's like the dam just blows open and all of there's so much that i want to say and it's very very overwhelming and disorganized and then how do they respond like they're overwhelmed and have no idea and then what does that do to the size of your dam? Well, I think once the good comes out and it runs them over, like if they haven't received it properly, then the angry starts to come out, actually. Sure. And then I think the next day what you do is you build your dam higher. Yeah, for the next person. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Right. So now we're seeing like, like this is all kind of tied together because like what happens is when you get a little bit of acceptance, yeah, you flood them with it. And so then what happens is like you get back to this kind of idea that like you're reinforcing this idea that you're like they're not going to accept what you have. And then you have to build the walls higher. Yeah. And actually, do, to be honest, it's like it's it starts from the pre in, in other words, even when I interact with people, it's like I start from the premise that. Uh, they're not going to accept me. And maybe if they accept things, it'll be because of my resume and because of the quality of the ideas. So I focus the whole conversation on these things that I'm not even sure they, when I'm talking with you, I'm not sure if anybody cares about. Okay, so... <clears throat> it's kind of like I'm preparing a case for why they should... It's like I'm preparing a case. Yeah, on I understand. On the one hand, I killed somebody, you know, so you... But then on the other hand, look at all these good things. And maybe yeah. on the balance, you can get over, you know, this dam because of all this stuff over here so bobby my mm. i'm gonna try to offer so first of all let's just take a step back because i'd like to offer you something kind of concrete <coughs> which i hope will let you move forward in a in like a at least one serious step because I, I i'm getting the sense that we're sort of teasing a lot of stuff apart but i'm going i'm getting a growing sense within me of like what do we do about all of this yeah so first of all, help me understand what we've covered today and and what you think like where are we? Like how, like recap for me what you understood from our discussion today. Give me one sec. So I had not said explicitly the part about my dad kind of <clears throat> my experiences with my dad giving me the sense that there may be something good here, but like no one will ever see it. And it's like, there's so much in the way that's bad. I had never explicitly said that. And I think that that's super core. Uh, aside from that, I think that I'm aware of most of what we discussed. And I think what we're talking about is kind of a double bind where yes, um, how do I put this? And I feel like that's where the sense of what do we do about it comes from, even in me, as I've worked very, very, very desperately on, you know, this, this problem. Um, in that I at the same time believe that I'm good and that I'm completely I believe that I'm like completely good and completely bad at the same time. Yep. And that that causes me to act in super confusing ways. Yep. To myself and to other people. Absolutely. Is that maybe the simplest way to put it? Beautiful way to put it, right? So so your confusion. This is a yeah. problem of confusion. This is a problem of someone who is taught that love involves physical abuse and then just gets fucking confused. Because there's a yeah. part of them that also realizes that they deserve 
honest and authentic love that involves no abuse. And there's a part of them that also has learned. Go. When I look for acceptance from my dad, I think that what the case that I want to provide is I'm almost saying, hey, dad, I heard everything that you told me and I started from the premise that I'm not going to make it. And so I thought about this, which is bad. And here's the answer. I've right. I've mitigated this problem with myself. And I've mitigated this one with myself and I've mitigated this one. And that's why you should trust me. In other words, I know that I'm bad and I've done all this work to like be acceptable for this one moment. What do you, what do you think about that? So that sounds like that's a very common pattern in your life, right? Have you done that? It's with like you? when you bring up the abuse, which is not my experience, but yeah. it's like, I want someone to hit me so that then, right, we can kind of get closer. I know that the hit's going to happen. Let's just get it over with. And then we can find our way to a place where like we can be okay with the fact that I got hit. Yeah. yeah. So what I'm hearing is, it, let, let's just, let's me. just, here's what I'm hearing from you in terms of like, you're the premise that you're unacceptable and damage control. You're saying, okay, why don't you guys just tell me I'm incompetent to begin with so that I can get to all of the reasons why you guys should still value what I'm doing. Hundred. Let's just yeah. get the fact that I'm incompetent completely out of the way. Let's start Let's there. Get it out of the way. Even if I'm incompetent, I still think you guys should buy this blender for $19.99 plus shipping and handling. And if you buy one right now, you're going to get a second one for free. That's exactly right. Right? That's exactly right. Yeah. And In other so, words, I'm the shittiest user of a blender. I cut all my fingers off. You, I can blender. Like, you should trust me because I'm an idiot. Yeah. No one understands incompetent blender customers more than me. <laughs> yeah. So how do we how do we get get out of this? Okay, so a couple of thoughts, okay? So the first is you have to let go of the premise that you're unacceptable. And I realize that's easy yeah. to say and hard to do. But the, the the tricky thing here is that when you're letting go the so why is it hard to let go of the premise you're unacceptable because it opens you up to uncertainty and potential failure. So in a weird way, you've got a game plan that involves Bobby being unacceptable. Yeah. And so the problem, I think what you what's really difficult is that you sort of built a party around, um, <coughs> you know, let's say like you're playing like an RPG and you like build a party that's like all mages. And then like you built this party and then you've come up with the strategy to like still win with all mages, even though all mages is like generally speaking a terrible party, but also my favorite kind of party to play. And so I come up with these like super convoluted strategies of like, you know, spamming consumables and buying scrolls and stuff early on in the game until my mages actually come online and then I fucking start tearing things apart. Because you can just CC and like AOE the shit out of anything that comes your way. And this is why you're successful. Because you came up with this sort of like premise that's messed up, but then you also have a lot of faith in when your strategy comes online. Yeah. And that's the bullet points, right? Because you're like, let's call me acceptable and let's move to the bullet points because the bullet points, like, that's when my page mages come online. And like, it doesn't yeah. matter. That it doesn't matter that we can't use swords or armor or we have no healers. Yeah. You guys think that this is busted because you think that you need a tank and you think you need a healer. But I can yeah. show you without all this stuff, with my all mage strategy, you can still do it. Yeah. So the really tricky thing here is that if you abandon your premise, you also abandon your solution and you abandon your possibility for success. You're re-entering a zone of uncertainty that could lead to failure once again. So I think that's yeah. part of the reason you, you attach yourself to this premise, because at the end of the day, this strategy, Bobby, has worked for you. Yeah. So what I, I want to ask, does it make a difference where, like you said, I can show you that this works and it's true. I can show you, but not if you don't look. And I've got this other thing about like, you'll never let me show you kind of thing. Sure. I think does that's, that change your analysis at all not, in terms of how not, I should think about it. Not really, because I think it's just okay. it's just that's just part of the. You know, it's part of the complex. It's part of the mechanism. So you have a sum scar, but then you also have these other like coping mechanisms that you've created in your mind to account for that. 
And, yes. and, and I think that like to unravel, so the really tricky thing. So, you know, when I, um, I'm just trying to think about this. So one of my supervisors once told me that growing up is the process of abandoning what works. Yeah. And that kind of struck me and I was kind of confused about that. And then, you know, as the more that I thought about it, it's sort of like, well, I mean, <clears throat> when you, when you, when you're two and you throw a temper tantrum, like you can kind of get away with that. But as you get older, there are things that you used to do that you have to give up. And like later in life, so for example, when I talk about medical students, so medical students are very, very grades oriented, and that's worked very well for them because they were at the top of their class in high school, top of their class in college, honors students did excellent, like, you know, have 3.9 GPAs and did really well on standardized tests. And they come to med school and they hit the hospital and then suddenly it's not about tests anymore. And so they, they've always tried to be the best. And so then they ask you over and over again, how am I doing? And we say, you're doing fine. You're doing great. Good job. Good job, kid. Good job. And then when, when grades come around, what grade do you think they get? I mean, I've had this experience. <clears throat> not a good one. So they get an average grade, which is in their yeah. mind, not a good one. And then they get really fucking confused because they're like, you said I did yeah, a great job every day. And you, I just got an average grade. And then we say, well, yeah, that's because you're average because you're, we're comparing you with other med students who are also showing up every day and working really hard and you're now average. And it kind of just blows their mind. So some kids get honors. Okay. And so then the, 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 I mean, the try hard med, they're all try hards. They get really confused and they're like, you said I did a great job. Yeah. I asked you what I need to do. They don't say it like this because they're too terrified of you. Like, I've spent my whole life with the professor telling me, you need to study this, 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 and this, and you will get an A on a test. And I came here and I asked you, what do you want me to do? You laid out my responsibilities. I fulfilled every one of those responsibilities. Why don't I get an A? And so what we have to do is teach them to abandon what works. And so what I try to explain to, to the med students is that, like, it doesn't matter, like, whether, like, I'm not the standard that you should be judging yourself by. Right. You're nodding, so it looks like you understood something. What, do you, what, are, you, what are you thinking? So I think I'm the person who asked that question directly. And if I don't get the answer that you're giving me, I get very angry. Yep. In other words, I feel it's acceptable to give this person an average grade when you've, you know, but then the next thing that you need to say is, okay, the way to get a better grade than average is to abandon what's worked. Like you yep. need to cultivate, and that's so, real growth. You know, that's real leadership. And I respect that. That's a good answer. So but if I get some dumbass answer, like, well, blah, 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 I get very upset. Yeah. So a lot of times the med students get upset. Thankfully, I've had some years to practice this. And so what I, what I tell them is like, you should be not thinking about what I want as your supervising physician. You should be thinking about your patient's needs. Yeah, for sure. And the, the, sure. the, the kids who get honors are the ones that actually don't, and it's not that they don't care about what I want. They do everything, but their focus is not on the grade. Their focus is on the patient. Yeah. That's and, my strength is that my focus is generally on the people who need and that I serve them. Yep. But then when it comes to my relationship with the professor, like, uh, it's contentious. No. It's contentious. And so, I don't so the, make it easy for the professor. I, okay. That, that I need to sit and think about that. So, so the, the point here is that like, Bobby, I think you've got a winning strategy and just like all of the med students who have a winning strategy that gets them to that point. What I try to impress upon the med students is you're no longer studying for a grade. Like, I don't think you guys get this one day you're going to be, it's uh, funny. I told this, this story yesterday. One day you're going to be on an airplane. And someone is going to ring a button, like a call bell, and that, or not, sorry, you're going to hear an announcement where the, the, the air host or the air hostess is going to say, is there a doctor on the plane? And then you're going to be terrified. It's happened to me. It's the most terrifying experience in the world. Scariest thing that's ever happened to me. And then you wait and you cross your fingers because you hope that there's someone else. Hmm. Right. You hope that someone else does it. No one does. And they say it again. And then you're like, well, fuck, I got to do this because this is what I trained for. Yeah. yeah. And you hit the call bell and then they go over and, you know, they you, they call you over and then you go and then like like there's a pregnant lady who's like has bad stomach cramps. And then the pilot asks you this question, which is, should we land the plane immediately? 
That's what you need to be studying for, and that's what you should think about every day when you come to the hospital. Understand it's not about pleasing me. It's not about knowing the names of your medications. It's that, like, one day someone is going to need your help, and are you prepared for that moment? Because it's fucking terrifying. Yeah. Is she having indigestion, or is she having a placental rupture, where not only is she losing the baby, but she's going to die within 60 minutes from internal bleeding? Or did she eat too much dairy? And in that moment, you can't say, I mean, my personal fear is I can't say I'm a fucking psychiatrist. I don't know real medicine. Yeah. <laughs> right? So that's what I'm scared of. And, and so the, the, somewhere along the way, the med students get that it's no longer about the grade and you're actually becoming a doctor and that people's lives are going to depend on you, even if you're a psychiatrist who, who spends his time talking to people on Twitch. If I'm on the subway... Or if I'm on an airplane, like, I can't say, I'm sorry, I spend most of my time on Twitch, I can't help you. Unacceptable. So they have to abandon what works. And what you have to do is abandon what works, and it's going to be terrifying. You have to let go. And what works in my case. So you have to let go of your list. You have to let go of your list, and you have to let go of your unacceptability. Yeah. So well, pra- if I let go of the unacceptability, then the list goes too. Beautiful. Right? But, but there's a lot of comfort in that whole package for you because that's what's worked. So you have to let yourself potentially fail. And what I mean by potentially fail is you have to give other people their agency back, which you take away from them. Yeah. <clears throat> right? You have to let them... Yeah. Right? So you have to let them be okay with your idea not being okay. That I don't yeah. think you can do. So that's something you need to work on, right? So in in the it, so th- this is I'm going to go back to kind of the abusive person. So the most terrifying thing for that person is actually like accepting the possibility that this person genuinely loves them. Because if this person treats them abusively and then five years ago from now they leave, the person in the abusive relationship is actually okay with that because they always knew it was going to happen. This is a game I've played before. I can deal with abandonment. I know how to do it. And as long as you hold on to the possibility, as long as you hold on to that idea that I'm not worth loving, it's easy to deal with abandonment. What's terrifying is actually like accepting someone's love and believing that you're not worth abandoning, not like carrying those, you know, putting those walls up and then the possibility of abandonment. People do not want to do that. They say, I can't take it. If I presume that I'm going to fail at the beginning, I can take a failure. But if I let myself hope and believe that I can be loved and that I can be successful and then I fail, uh uh-uh, can't do it. It's going to destroy me. I'm not that strong. So there's something very protective about all of this stuff for you. Yeah. Right? It's the same reason why half of our audience doesn't give it their all when they study for a test. Yeah. Because if you study for a test and you studied as hard as you could and you get a B, you're fucking dumb. Mm -hmm. But if you're lazy... You get to hold on to being smart because I didn't give it my all. Yeah. Giving it your all is the most terrifying thing in the world because then if you fall up short, you're short and there's no excuse. Yeah. So I think you've got to give it your all and I think you've got to let let go of control. Couple of other things to remember. One is that I want you to recognize that this some scar exists within you, right? So it's not correct it's not wrong, it's just a piece. Yeah. It's like if you're developing a strategy for Smash, like, you know, you can, there are different characters that have different strategies. It's not like one is the dominant truth, it's just there are different ways to play the game. Mm -hmm. So in your case, you have a four or five-year-old that sometimes thinks this, all this unacceptability stuff like that, and it's going to dictate, it's going to want to dictate your actions. Yeah. As best as you can, <clears throat> as you see that, just notice that it wants to dictate your actions. But that it doesn't, you don't have to let that dictate your actions. Just see it within you. It doesn't mean it's wrong. Right? So like you're in a double bind because you've got one horse that's pulling you this way and one horse that's pulling you this way. Put the horses together. They're still individual horses. They're not different. But you can move in one direction, even though one of them is like, like you know you can have that four-year-old within you and acknowledge that that person is there and still move forward and still speak and still recognize that i don't have to convince people i'm gonna actually just i'm gonna choose 
to let go of the unacceptability and also the absolute cheat code, God mode of my logic. I'm going to let go of them both. I'm going to share my ideas and then I'm going to let people like, because I know that like there's a part of me that doesn't want to just share my idea. You guys, you guys have to listen Dude. to all of it. <clears throat> Don't just listen to part of it. Don't judge if, me if halfway. If I were you, like I like actually, and I I love watching your stream because you approach this so differently. You start with your idea, and you. If I were you, my stream would have been two months of me saying like, okay, I've thought about this. I could have been wrong in this. I could. In other words, I never would have shared my ideas because I would have just shared this extensive case about like why you should listen to me, even though you probably. Do you know what I mean? No. Like when you t if imagine if you started your stream and you were like, hey, I know that you guys don't spirituality. Let me like, do you know, and you kind of defended this angle. You defended. Yeah. You're just totally obsessed with why people shouldn't believe you, and you're just attacking these beliefs that you believe could be out there. And then after all that, then you share your ideas. Yeah. So so I mean, it's I, like I, such a shit way to talk. Like, absolutely. I do that. So and like no, the reason that I people don't. I don't because it doesn't work. Right. So like like this it doesn't is, work. I can so, tell you. So, Bobby, like, let me tell you right. what I think I'm I do agreeing with you right now. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think what you, so like I don't I don't I don't know that I'm going to help you. I don't know that what you're going to say is going to be acceptable to you. I, I just I have no idea. Right. So what I have is a sense of faith in who I am, but I don't have yeah. the the winning strategy. And not to draw too much of a comparison between the two of us, but I think that's the only thing that works because I've tried it your way and it doesn't fucking work. It doesn't. Is that you be the person that you are and you let your compass of trying to help these gamers on Twitch and 60% of people are lonely. And you go to those people, you go to your colleagues at Twitch and you say, hey, I have this idea. I'd love to share it with you guys. And you don't try to convince them. You let them, you, you, you know, it's, it's the cake that's in the display case. You're not the person who's giving out samples. You're just going to make your cake. You're going to stick it in the display case and you're going to let them choose. And if they want it, they're going to have it. You're not the person who's like, hey, would you like to try? Hey, 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 try this. Oh, but put a little schmear of this on, on this. Why don't you dip it in here? Like, you know, like just take a step back and, and give what you have to give and let the world receive it. And recognize that there's the four-year-old, the five-year-old who's going to be terrified about that. There's all the whole gold nugget and shit. Like what you need to do is give them a, sh a shit cake with a gold nugget on top just give them it give it all to them don't try to just give them the gold and don't try to hold back the shit just give it all to them because they see it all anyway i know it's terrifying but i think that there's like you're just not you're not that manipulative to where you can really hide that much bobby you're not very manipulative so you're like no, low I'll on the so continue you're low on the sociopathy scale. Like your kind of strategy of filtering information and stuff like that works. You just have to be way more sociopathic for that to be a successful strategy for you. The last thing that I'll leave you with is we got to talk about your mom. Okay. So another thing, and I don't know that we have to do this today, but one of my supervisors once told me it's the parent that they don't talk. So one parent's the smoking gun and then there's another parent that they don't talk about. And the money is with the parent that they don't talk about. There's plenty with, yeah, there's plenty there. Okay. <laughs> it flipped though. I will tell you it flipped. If I was 18, I would have only talked about my mom. Sure. Not talked about my dad. Right. So th there's a lot about acceptability and, and who you became to be. And I'm sorry that, you know, it sounds like there were many experiences where you really did just try to be yourself and the world punished you for it. Yeah. And, and I think you just need to recognize that like that happened to you. And just because the world has punished you in the past, I mean, there are overwhelming numbers of people who have accepted you for who you are. And yet this some scar has not been processed because like it's not some scars can't fight against each other like that. Like you, you were beloved in the Smash community. You know, it's clear that, you know, my Twitch chat likes you. I like you. You're married. Yeah. Your wife likes you. Presumably you have a three year old. He's kind of a he fan. He likes me a lot. Yeah. He thinks I'm cool. Yeah. Do you feel unacceptable with him? Dude, sometimes. Yeah. So notice that, right? And understand yeah, that's in that's the past how... week for sure. I've noticed it more because that was the practice you gave me. Yeah, I do notice it more. So but that's not coming from him. It's coming from you. A hundred percent. Right. So that you the can... thing that I the thing that was said to me yesterday that I think really helped uh, was that it's like I at a certain point when I was very young, I chose to have me be the me that my dad saw or that somebody else saw. Mm -hmm. 
and like I had to re-remember who the me was that made that decision because yep. that me is the one that's uh, you know does that kind of make sense it like, makes perfect so i'll put it to you another way so i think what so some scars and the things that you cope around them are learned behaviors yeah so like i, I think about anxiety i mean not all like sometimes it's you know true biological anxiety that wasn't learned but for a lot of people especially the kind of anxiety that i see a lot now it's like a learned anxiety it's just yeah. your brain literally trying to cope or adapt to a certain set of circumstances and I, I don't know, I mean, I think you made a choice. I, I don't know if I would call it a choice, but I definitely think that you, I mean, yeah, you can call it a choice. I think it was sort of a subconscious choice, maybe is a good way to put it. But I think yeah. you learned to accept your dad's premise about who you are. In the same way that the yeah. abuse of, the person who gets into an abusive relationship, who has abusive parents, learned to accept their opinions, like their parents' opinions of, of who they are. Mm-hmm. And so I completely agree. And that's why we got to go back to like where this started, right? And I think, sure, maybe it was the four-year-old. I think these some scars has been kind of added on to. Those are all pieces that are strengthening it. Yeah. But there's just this general idea that like, you know, you're not acceptable, number one. And secondly, that there's something about people that are that you love and respect being forced to associate with you despite your smell. <laughs> yeah. It's you know? a good way to put it. <laughs> And and just notice those things. And I, I'd say, like, you know, Bobby, I think I think you've got a, unfortunately a long road ahead of you. But I think you know I have faith that you're going to do do well, not because you have a winning strategy, but because I think you're going to continue to try. Well, I'm definitely going to continue to try. Yeah. Thoughts or questions? Do you have any? Uh, <clears throat> I would like to meditate again and have a practice i've kind okay. of did some chanting but i only kind of do it at home like when you can hear me i think that feels really good like letting it out as opposed to forcing it is a big difference yep uh yeah give me a second and then i also feel like yeah go ahead go ahead no, go i was ahead. just gonna say i also you know when i've kind of done sort of parts of myself like kind of thought about what's going on in my experience i think i actually have like a pretty strong third eye experience when i am understanding something but I, the practice of pointing my finger i never connected the dots between those two places i guess and i okay. wonder if there's something there that i could let me just think for a second um Okay, let me just think for a second. I'm going to just take a quick ad break because I've been told to do that one. And then I just need to think. And then we'll teach meditation when I get... And I need to blow my nose and stuff. So I'm going to just run to the restroom. Let's talk about meditation when I get back. Cool. Okay. <clears throat> Ad is still there? Okay, let me think. No ads? <laughs> Chat, should we do something new? Or something old? Should we do the same one again? So how do we teach you a meditation about acceptability? Let me think.
Do you want something that's a little bit more focused or more contemplative? So like, I'm quite so, contemplative is my go-to strategy. So maybe that's not like I'm good at it, but it, on the other hand, I use it to deal with my as a coping strategy, not as a yeah. So I, I mean. I, I, I'm not, I think sometimes when it comes to meditation, the goal is for you to have a practice that's easy, kind of easy for you to do. So we can try to do something contemplative. Um, I'm okay. just trying to figure so, out. To be honest, I think that, so <clears throat> I think that if I could, um, so there's a place when I was learning how to, how to wave dash, it's like an advanced tech in Super Smash Brothers, <clears throat> where if you're trying to learn something in a video game, you kind of just go into it being like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to beat this level. I'm going to, I'm going to learn how to do this. And it doesn't matter if it takes a week or a month or a year. You're just gonna, gonna kind of do it, and you kind of, ex do you, it's like a an inner faith or something that you're just gonna keep trying, and it's it's okay to mess up. And I really love that part of video games. And I'm wondering, like, if there's a way to kind of, right, like, just recommit to being me and not worry about the consequences of being me. That was the thing that you said last time that really stuck with me. Yeah. I think I live in the consequences of being me. And so I'm trying to refocus like where my mind is to not five seconds after whatever I'm thinking about saying, but just where I, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. That's helpful. So I, I think that we're going to do something that maybe is a little bit different, but. <clears throat> Let me just think about how to structure this. How can I... How do you feel about breath-oriented meditations? My breathing sucks. So I feel really good about it. What is that? I breathe very shallowly. Uh, I find it very difficult to breathe deeply. I find that uh, I kind of feel like I um, like I don't know if it's gas or whatever, but something will build up when I'm trying to breathe deeply that does that kind of prevent gets in the way. Then I kind of feel like I have to burp or something, hmm. which does also doesn't work. I don't, I don't know if that's super weird, but. Okay, first thing that I want you to do is sit up straight and close your eyes. Let me get a pillow. Sure. Hips, uh, hips above knees. Yep, very good. Okay. So... I'm going to teach you a technique around the double bind, okay? Mm -hmm. So I want yeah. you to notice. Um, you, but do you have a, a a tennis ball by chance or something that's tennis ball shaped? Can you go grab it? I can. So, uh, if you guys have a tennis ball, go grab one. Um, if you don't have a tennis ball, we're going to try to use your fist, okay? So, Bobby, I want you to close your eyes and breathe in and out through your nose. And tell me first if you can discern whether one, ball, uh, one nostril is more open than the other. I think my right. Okay, so go ahead and block your left nostril and breathe in through your right. It doesn't, does, any finger, it doesn't matter. Yeah, so just bl block one nostril and breathe in. And then after one breath, switch and then check the other nostril. Full breath? Yeah. Just confirm whether you're left gang or right gang. Maybe left, I don't know. Kind of in the middle. I 
I think left's more clear. Okay. So then what I want you to do is to take the tennis ball and stick it under your left armpit, kind of up into the armpit, like push it up. Yep. You kind of feel it pressing into your, like, up in there. Okay. Kind of make it yeah. almost a little bit uncomfortable, like pressure. Yeah, it's a little un- I feel a little bit of like in the back kind of. Okay, like so so like almost like imagine if you were like leaning with your yeah, armpit like a over a railing. Okay, good. So close your eyes. Now observe your breath. And with each breath, notice which nostril is more open. And then try to catch the transition. So you can put your fist into your armpit if you want. The other thing that you can do is lay down on the, if you guys are watching at home, if that's, it switched. Did you catch it? I think it did. So if it's switched, then move the tennis ball. Other armpit. Can I confirm it? Yeah. Switch the tennis ball. Now catch it this time. So the other thing that y'all can do, because the fist can be a little bit awkward, is that you can lay down on the side of your open nostril. So if your left nostril is open, lay down on your left. And if your right nostril is open, lay down on your right. It switched again? Are you catching it? I I think it was between two breaths. Like it was the exhale. So I want you to focus at the it kind of the the back or top of your nose, because that's where you may feel the switch, and you're gonna get one breath in there with both nostrils open, maybe a couple. I feel like it's switching really fast. It's it's a it starts on the side. Yeah, it's switching super fucking fast. Okay, so now we have your problem, right? So I think this is, so you got it. So you could stop for a second, Bobby. So what I'm going to do, uh, let's try to do it slightly differently. Which one's open now? Left. Okay, so I want you to, your couch in the back, I want you to lay down on your left side. Okay. And just kind of. Just, try to just be lay down on your left. A... Nope, just lay down on, on your left side. Yeah, it's it's very strange that his is switching correctly. So I think this is the right technique for him. I won't be able to hear you. Okay, so <clears throat> lay down on your on whichever side is open, and then watch it switch, and then come back when it after it switches. All right. And try to catch yourself in the middle of the switch. Yeah, it's very strange. It normally does not switch that fast. Yeah, he can relax. Oh, fuck. How do I tell him to put a pillow under his head? Because he looks fucking awkward. Jesus, that looks uncomfortable. (laughs) He looks so stiff. (laughs) Poor Bobby. He tries so hard. Okay. I think I caught it, dude. Okay, so it was quick? Okay, good. So first of all, you know, you can lay down in a more relaxed fashion. You don't have to, like, keep your head... Like, you could have, like, gotten on a pillow just comfortably. Okay. Okay. So first of all, it's very unusual that you're, you're... your noddies are switching so rapidly like usually it takes like at least uh, like 6 30 60 seconds so but this also is cool because i think this is the right technique for you <clears throat> so bobby you we've been talking about the double bind what you need to learn how to do is to live in between two things 
to live in the tension as opposed to being pulled on, on the two sides. So there's a tension within you. And I think it's clear to me that like you need to live in the space of that transition. So there's going to be one breath in there where either inhalation or exhalation, things are going to be even and balanced before you switch over. So just spend time in the middle of those two things. And what you can you can also do is like you don't I mean, this is weird. I've never had someone who switches so quickly. Um, so I don't know that you need to. I've got a theory about this, by the way. Go ahead. I, I think that I learned very young not to trust myself. So my left and right hemispheric brains don't trust each other. So there's just a bunch of like, I, I don't know if that makes any sense, but I just like, as I think through things, I notice that I switch from like, what is the meaning and how does this make sense holistically to, well, none of the facts support this. And yeah. it's like, they're kind of disagreeing and they're fighting all the time. Right. So you need to find your corpus callosum, which is the thing that connects your two hemispheres, right? So you need to find, you need to live in the in-between spaces. The battleground that's the, so so it's so it shouldn't in there it shouldn't be a battleground right so i what i want you to understand so like imagine that i have two you know if i take like two boards and i lean them against each other those two boards are opposing each other and you could argue that that's a battleground right because one of them wants to fall this way the other one wants to fall this way but when i set them up there's actually like there's no conflict there's just the tendency of one board and the tendency of the other board are creating conflict and opposition, but in between them, there's actually peace and balance. And you need to start learning how to live in that space, and I think this is a technique that's going to help you with that. Just like yeah. you said, you're, uh, if your two hemispheres don't touch each other, fantastic. So start to lo lo live in the in-between spaces. Do you have any and idea what that feels like? Could you kind of maybe say a word or two about what it might feel like to live in the tension and um yes Maybe i can but i'm not going to okay so part of this is tricky because i'm trying to teach you sort of a middle technique without the beginning and without the end so this is sort of the preparatory technique the main thing though is that the other thing you can do is you don't necessarily have to use the tennis ball if you're switching very rapidly you can just observe your breath and catch the, the switch naturally. Okay. So I, I don't think that you should have it ping, ping ponging back and forth so rapidly. So if you want to, you know, have it breathe for a couple minutes and then you want to force a switch, you can breathe for a couple minutes and then you want to force a switch, but see if you can catch the natural transition. And, and when that tr transition happens, just fully implant yourself in that space with one breath that is both right nostril and left nostril. And then you tell me how it feels to live in the in-between. Okay? Thoughts, Will questions? No, it feels good. Thanks right, so man. much for everything that you're doing, man. <clears throat> yeah, man, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for coming on a couple times and also, you know, um, rescheduling so rapidly. For sure. Um, any thoughts on who we should raid? Uh, I'm. I was thinking I would stream. So I mean, if you if you want to, yeah, we can just raid you. Let's raid Bobby. Are you streaming? Sure, my, I'm about to. I wasn't because the camera won't let me. It wouldn't let me. You know, you couldn't see me. Go to while Bobby. I was streaming. Okay. Which underscore scar? All right. Thanks a lot, Bobby. We'll we'll raid you in a Thank few minutes. Thank you again. Okay? Take care. Yeah. You too. Oh wow. Thank you, Mash Stars, for the... How many is that? Holy. 100 gift bomb. Thank you very much for the, you know, gigantic pile of subs. Okay, so for a couple of things to make things... Um... So, you know, sometimes I struggle on stream because I'm not sure, like, what to teach because some stuff is very applicable to the person and I think less applicable to Twitch chat. Um, dodged what? I'm confused. Why does people say dodged? Oh, they dodge the subs. <laughs> Thanks for the hundred gifted subs. Really, Mash Stars. Uh, we really appreciate it. So that'll go to, you know, it'll go to fund something or other. Um, so... I'm sorry if that, you know, that meditation practice was, like, odd for you guys, because it's very strange that Bobby's, like, switching so rapidly. 
But if you guys are, um, if you're struggling in some way and you feel like you're in a double bind, that practice could be good for you too. So this practice is part of something called swara sadhana. Swara means breath or sound. And yoga is sort of a particular set of practices that are sort of designed to get you to enlightenment purely through the breath. Um, and it's different from Vipassana because Swara Sadhana isn't really about doing things with your breath, which is more pranayam. It's about observing nuances of the breath. So I'll give you guys kind of a, another practice. So if you close your eyes and you pay attention to your breath, you'll feel the flow of air through your nostrils, right? And now I want you to figure out which of your nostrils is dominant. So one of your nostrils is going to be more open than the other. Left gang or right gang? Okay. So now what I want you guys to do, if you're all ready for the next level, this is going to be hard. Left gang, right gang. So if you guys have some practice with this. Now I want you to notice the direction of the breath. Okay? Within your nose. So what I mean by that is... Okay. No. So if you think about your nose like this, right? So here's your right nostril. Here's your left nostril. Dr. K. Okay. So you can feel, ooh, let's use like a brush or something. Yeah. So you can feel the breath around here, or you can feel it here, or you can feel it here. There's going to be a dominant place where your breath is coming out of your nostril. It's going to be equal both sides very rarely. Does this make sense to anyone? There's going to be one area, like it could be here or here, where you're going to feel the breath more. There are five distinct zones. So what you guys want to do is as you breathe, just notice which zone you're in. Right, so this is tricky because, like, uh, so Swara Sadhana is hard. It's like a more subtle practice, and it's like really not for everyone, which is fine. Doesn't mean you're bad at meditation. The whole point of teaching different meditation techniques is because, like, some people know what charging the laser beam feels like, and other people are like, I have no idea what that is. And other people, you do left gang, right gang, and they're like, yeah, that makes perfect sense. How do you guys not understand this? So what you guys want to do is just pay attention to the different zones of your nose. And just focus on that and try to feel what they are. So what I'll ask you guys is that I'll tell you that there are a certain number of zones in each nostril. So you guys tell me what are the zones of each nostril. So I'll say, let, let's say five, okay? So there are five directions that your breath can go within each nostril. And, and try to just see, try to find all five in each nostril. And that's your meditation practice. Right? So it's not so important what it is right now, but as you... So what I want you guys to do is... Um, is understand... So try to catch all five of them. The zones are, are what you, you need to figure that out. I'm not going to tell you what they are. And if you guys don't know what, what I'm talking about, that's actually completely fine. Right? So for those of you who think your five head like digital donger, that's just four directions, buddy. Where's the fifth? And do this practice. Do it throughout the day because you're not going to like, does this make sense? Like if one zone is active, that's the zone that's going to be active right now. You can continue watching the breath, but it's going to be the same part that's going to be active. 
And so practice it for a while. So listen, guys, I just want to thank you guys again for um, all of the support and for all the subs and things like that. Uh, you know, 